So today's recording is not about a battle involving torpedo boats. It isn't. PC-109 is not the subject of today's discussion. I'm sorry, this is a far earlier battle. A far better conducted battle from the American perspective. And a battle which from the Japanese perspective was a sad inkling of what was to come. Although, frankly, it wasn't the first battle in the Guadalcanal series, so it's not even that in some regards. I'm talking about the Battle of Black and Strict. And this is a battle where the Americans are going to go for a bombardment. They literally are just doing their regular bombardment routine. It's got so routine there, frankly, they don't know what else they're doing. And um, they presume that the Japanese are coming to attack them, but in fact the Japanese are just doing a routine resupply mission. So both sides are doing routine missions. The Americans have the advantage of knowing the Japanese are there, knowing the Japanese are coming, and having a lot more firepower with them actually being there for a fighting mission. Whereas the Japanese destroyers are armed light. I think they do have some torpedoes, but they certainly don't get to use them. And they are there to try and do it, carry out a resupply. In fact, they've carried out their resupply and they're heading back. So they think they're on a safety, you know, they think they're going home to safety. And we call it a battle because... Well, the Japanese were there. They were warriors. They were at sea. They were in, they're in a war zone. But they never got a chance to fight back. It's a battle as in... I don't know... The Battle of Cape Bon. It was a scenario where the enemy never had a chance. And when I say they never had a chance, they didn't know their opponent was there. They were outmaneuvered. They were outnumbered, outgunned. Pretty much, you have a pair of destroyers heading into a scenario where they are fighting half a flotilla of American destroyers and uh, pretty much a full division of cruisers as the Americans were running things at the time. Squadron being roughly eight ships, a division being roughly four. It's just... It's a nightmare for the Japanese. But what can we learn from this operation? What can we learn from it? Well... There are lots of lessons to be learned from the Battle of Blackett Strait. For starters, that the enemy gets a vote. I'd also argue that as we go through it, you're going to learn the lesson of you always presume your enemy has more information and is doing the correct thing with that information. Because if you presume they don't have the information and they're not doing the correct thing, then you're caught out when they do do the right thing. But if you presume they're doing the right thing, and they presume they have the correct information, then when they do something which is actually bumbling along to what, towards what is probably a sensible thing to do, you're ready for them. You're ready for them. That's an important thing to think about. You have to be ready for them. Now, before we get into this too much... A, shameless book plug. B, there's a little over a week now for the video for the uh, competition to win. That where two copies of this are up for uh, for, uh, for winners, and um, they'll be signed and notified, and they'll have a little paragraph, probably about your uh, probably about your submission in there. Uh, it's it's looking fairly good, but I would love more. I would always love more submissions because I think there are more great submissions out there, and there's a link to the video down below. Secondly. I had a very strange DM on Discord last night, which was about following me on TikTok. Now, here is the thing. I am very socially engaged for an academic. I am on Twitter. I am on Instagram, although I do pretty much nothing other than post pictures when we're traveling around on ship shape trips. And occasionally pictures which are to do with my Justin Craig work because they love doing Instagram and that's a big thing about advertising um, 
Justin Craig as a company, and they're a very good revision company in the UK. Uh, I have to say myself, I did do some one-to-one -one tuition when I was younger, which was in maths, because I have fun with algebra. I really do have fun with algebra. Dyslexia is fun, okay? My dyslexia comes up in two ways. One of those is if you put letters and numbers next to each other, I will start mucking the letters around. And the letters and numbers around. And the other way is when it comes to, well, people's names, pretty much. That That's the big areas where my dyslexia shows up in terms of things people normally see. My short-term memory is covered for a lot by my long-term memory. And my dysgraphia, which has been hocked off from dyslexia to be something different, my bad handwriting, is actually due to the way my brain is set up because it's basically a computer running with no RAM, is how I explain to people. My hand is like a printer trying to keep up with nowhere to buffer the information. And because my hand can theoretically go as fast as I can think, it should be able to keep up and so my brain doesn't slow down. When I'm typing, my brain slows down enough my hands can keep up, I don't have the problem. Hence I did my exams on computers. Now, so, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Freds, I'm on Facebook. There is a page for this, uh, for this YouTube channel on Facebook, mainly because I didn't want someone else setting up one without it, and it's a nice place. Over. I even have a WhatsApp link channel that people can get updates about videos and of course discord so I'm on all these I'm not on TikTok I'm not on TikTok for a variety of reasons mostly because security I, when I was actually considering it some of the organizations I work with some of the things I do interact with have a very strict policy of not being on TikTok and more because even when I'm not in relationship with those organizations, I have enough social media to manage. So if you see me on TikTok or you see someone in the comments, they've all been caught by the spam filter, I think, so far. But if they're suggesting to follow me on TikTok, it's not me. I also do not have any accounts which might involve you going to certain... How do I put this politely? Things like Telegram. Again, don't have it. Just don't. Again, there are only so many social media platforms I can bother, be bothered to manage. And I have just about peaked out. And if you look at what I put on Freds and what I put on Twitter, and to extent what I put into the Facebook post and the WhatsApp channel, you might notice that what I do is I write it in one of those four, and then I copy and paste it through the others. <laughs> so, that is about the limit of my uh, wishing to engage. I like chatting away on Discord with people. I like chatting away on YouTube with people. I'm not going to get into any more. So, any suggestions you see of me being on these other things, doing these other things, that's just not me. And if I do get on anything else, I will tell you about it. I find the WhatsApp channel is interesting. I have the WhatsApp channel because, kind of like Fred's, I have them set up for if anything happens with X, what used to be known as Twitter, but and we still pretty much all call it Twitter. And we know what we mean. Mainly I had that set up because, eh, honestly... Everyone's moving around, and as an academic going for interviews at various universities, you get asked these things. I think I also have something else as well. I do have something else as well, but I'm terrible at updating it. I think it's the purple thing. Anyway, uh, it's it's not TikTok. It's, um... Garris the Brit wanted me on it. He said it was a good one to jo go and join. And I have it set up. You really should remember what it is. Oh, well, leaving that all to one side. That's the serious portion of the Shameless Book Plug done. Apologies it took so long, but I felt I needed to say that because of what apparently, according to this Discord DM chat I had last night, um, the version of me on TikTok is saying... 
I don't know who they are. I'm hoping. Uh, I, I, I would prefer it if they don't exist. I don't know. I didn't bother to go check. I wasn't going to set up a TikTok account to go find out. I just took their word for it and just went, yeah, I will add in. I am not on this. I am not on TikTok. So, the Blackett Strait, the Solomon Islands, the Guadalcanal campaign. Now, this had been a major battle. It had been a major campaign. It was critical for securing Australia, for securing the trade routes and movements of goods backwards and forwards between America and Australia. It was critical for pushing back the Japanese. It was also a problem for the Japanese because their expansion had been, to an extent, unopposed. Everyone's forces were elsewhere. Everyone's commitments were elsewhere because, nice way, it's the classic case of what you have happening in January 1939 and people talk about with the prepara Britain's preparations for war. Britain's preparations for war in up to sort of about May 1939 are very much focused on the Far East. Why? Because as recently as January 1939, and also there's another interesting incident in March 1939, they are literally pointing guns at the Japanese, and the Japanese are pointing guns at them. And I know I keep saying this in videos, but it seems to me a lot of people do not realize this. So I'm going to say this in every video I ever have that has a reasonable reason to put it in, just to try and spread it out so people understand that it was not being stupid. It was not Britain wasn't paying attention to Germany, it's just... In the run of risks, you have Germany, you have a moustached man making hot air statements. Uh, in Italy, you have a very large gentleman going around making bellicose statements but forgetting to buy fuel for his fleet. And in Japan, you have an organized, militarized, not dictatorship, but, um, uh, but uh, geritocracy-ish... Uh, Junterish, aristocratish, all sorts of weird, definitely, uh, how about authoritarian government based around uh, theocracy and monarchy at this, that they are trying to magnify up. It's a really interesting mix, and honestly, you can sum it up best by saying Japan if you want one word. It's its own special mix who do have fairly decent infrastructure, who have invested in a large navy, who have expansionist plans and are actually actively fighting wars with their expansionist plans in China, etc. and other areas, and accidentally hitting British and American ships, and are literally pointing guns at you and you pointing guns at them. In that scenario, which would you be prioritizing as your, as your real threat? It's going to be the Japan and Japanese. Yes, the others are closer. And that's where it comes into a balancing act of which one you think is. So that's why you're trying to deter Japan by orientating forces out there to deter Japan, whilst also maximizing your training and your creation of forces so you have enough forces to defend your presence in the Mediterranean, in the North Sea, and home fleets, and in the Far East. That's another reason why Britain's plans... 1937 onwards were the idea was to build up to 20, 25 capital ships and about a dozen or so aircraft carriers. That was their plan. Because of the threat of conflict. And in 1937, that's a sensible plan. It's a viable plan for Britain to do. You know, Britain hasn't got the world de debt from World War II. It's coming out of the depression quite well. It's got a lot of infrastructure it can build on, so it doesn't need to you to invest to build the infrastructure in many ways it needs to upgrade and modernize the infrastructure but that's a very different cost paradigm and that's also all that investment and modernization is going to employ a lot of people which is going to help them grow their economy out of depression the government had finally realized that actually there is a way to get get out of depression it's to spend your way out oh it's the traditional way we did before we had the washington naval treaties and london naval treaties when we spent on we bought ships as a way to get ourselves out of depression. It worked for the British economy. Who would have thought an island, an island industrialized island economy, 
which depends on sea trade, has an empire held together by the sea, and has a very strong shipbuilding industry with an infrastructure and history with a lot of shipbuilding around the country, uh, would find shipbuilding a good way to employ people and get itself out of depression. It's, it's a startling revelation, it really is. It's like no economist ever studies history, it's just obscene. <sighs> They do, they do. I mean, economists do, but they, they, um... Like with all, sci all areas where there is a mixture of science and art, sometimes you get bad ones who get famous by trying to force the art to match the science. I.e. they go through history and they cherry-pick things which fit their... their their particular opinion, or rather their theory. And they go, look, my theory is supported by this evidence. And you go, well, have you looked at wider context, and have you looked at this evidence, and have you looked at this scenario, this scenario? Well, uh, these, are the be these are the best examples. All those others fit, but they fit in a nuanced way. In other words, they don't fit. But getting back from all that, we have the Battle of Blackett Strait. We have the Solomon Islands. We have the Guadalcanal uh, campaign. The thing is, the Japanese had overextended themselves. Yes, they'd have all those advantages. Yes, everyone would be building up to fight them. And yes, everyone had been reorientated by a war to be fighting everywhere else. And then suddenly, and then they decide to go and do their attacks. Which aren't a bolt out of the blue, but everyone didn't really realize what timing. And didn't really realize the full level of their capabilities, let's be honest. Uh, the Japanese had managed to hide some of their flexibility and maneuverability. And some of their organizational strength. Although, to make sense, some of that, uh, that, some of that being hidden wasn't hidden from intelligence organizations. It was just hidden from the governments, and especially the top leadership, by their own, for want of a phrase, racism. Although, honestly... Most it's a version of racism which would you considered stereotypism. Uh, that's my own uh, my own view. There is sort of uh, I, be, for historical terminology, I sometimes divide racism up, and there's stereotypism where you basically have a racial stereotypes of everyone, and that's what you follow. And there is the racism where you actively are insulting people to their faces and going out and being wanting to you know, white people out and doing all that sort of level. And the thing is, neither is nice. Let's get honest. There isn't one as bad as the other. But one, you find even the people who you would historically look at and go, these are the good people because they don't do all this, tend to fall into that trap. Because that's how they brought up and how they approached the world. And it's annoying. So, you basically, you have to always think is, what kind of this am I dealing with? Anyway, if that takes us through to the Solomon Islands Guadalcanal campaign. Okay, war's begun, then now the, sort of the battles are in, and now there's been great fight back. And slowly, slowly things are being pushed back. You've had Midway, you've had Coral Sea, you've had... The start of the Essex Swarm are starting to come in and starting to be of use. You have all sorts of things starting to appear in these operations. And the Japanese are actually being very sensible. Again, something we don't often hear about in the ja in the campaign in, in the Pacific. We often hear about the Japanese fighting to the bitter end, doing banzai charges and all these things. Well, yes, they do do that, but they also are quite sensible. And in this occasion, they basically abandoned quite a large chunk of Guadalcanal going, actually, no, what we'll do is we'll withdraw all these people to this position which we can reinforce, this position which we can resupply, and this position which we can actually strengthen. And that's what they've done. They'd done that so well, they'd actually caught the Americans on the hop. Because the Americans went, hmm, where have the Japanese gone? The Americans had presumed the destroyers and the other ships coming down were doing a resupply run. Because that is the sensible thing to presume. If you don't know, presume they're resupplying and strengthening the position and you're going to have a harder fight. But actually what the Japanese were doing was an extraction in the face of the enemy. 
one of the most difficult maneuvers, if not the most difficult maneuver, you can do. Because it's all the frill and fun of an amphibious warfare operation with have the added extra fun of having to break contact in such a way that your enemy doesn't realize you're broken contact and doesn't charge straight after you, stopping you being able to organize and evacuate your forces. That's what the Japanese achieved. That is something skillful. The thing is, though, that moves the targets up. And at this point, then, the Americans start going, right, then, we're going to have to do some follow-on. We're going to have to do follow-on amphibious operations. Before we do that, we want to soften up these targets. How are we going to soften them up? We're going to do bombardments. Yes, we're going to take our cruisers. We're going to take our destroyers. We're going to take these things, which have a huge amount of firepower. And we're going to expend a lot of things deploying that firepower. And that's what they do. Sometimes it's allied efforts. Sometimes you'll find Royal Australian Navy vessels, even Royal Navy vessels, will be taking part. Royal New Zealand Navy vessels take part. These things are all there assisting, carrying out these operations, carrying out bombardments. And sometimes they run into uh, to Japanese resistance, air power especially. Sometimes they manage to avoid it completely. Sometimes they do a night operation like they're doing in this scenario, where, frankly, there is nothing the Japanese can really do unless they manage to put some destroyers in position. And the thing is, at the same time, the Japanese are, of course, resupplying these positions. And how best to resupply them? Run the supplies fast. Again, it's like the Battle of Cape Bon, where the Italians are trying to resupply North Africa using their light cruisers. Running fast... Full of supplies, fuel all on their decks. The Japanese were lucky, they dropped off the supplies. The Italians at Cape Bon had the supplies all on their deck. In the scenario at Cape Bon, the Royal Navy destroyers struck from the northern landward side, i.e., they were striking from the direction of the coast of France and Italy, with the direction the Italians really didn't think they'd be coming from. Whereas, in this battle, the Japanese were wandering through the straits and thinking they were going to get home. And it turned out they were not alone. And they were picked up on radar. And yes, the Americans were in the exact angle you'd expect the Americans to be coming from, but the Japanese had no chance. So... Japan's interest, what are they supplying? What are they coming and supplying? Well, it's the Kolombangara garrison, which is a, the critical garrison they were drawn to, to try and defend Rabul. This is part of the defense of Rabul, which is the keystone of the southern resource area. Rabul is a major, major base. It is a critical point for them to try and defend what they have taken. And again, this is a very sensible scenario. This space is well within range of resupply from Rabul. Rabul is the main hub where you are sending the supplies down. So think of it as the Japanese operating almost on a hub and spoke system as we do with a lot of airlines and a lot of flying in the world. There are national hubs, regional hubs, international hubs, all these things. And basically, you often find your flights, if you're not doing, be able to get a direct flight between from point A to point B, which is usually from hub to hub, you have to go from point A to point C to point D, and then out to point B. With the planes getting changing size depending on the value of the route, and depending on the level of the two, uh, two, uh, two sites involved. Well, in this scenario, the Japanese would do a major convoy down to Rabult. That would be merchant ships. That would be maybe even an escorted convoy. When it's very important, it might have a cruiser, even something else with it, to escort that convoy and make sure it gets there. And then, once they got to Rabul, it's a case of, right then, how are we going to get it out to Villa Stanmore? How are we going to get it out to the R airfield? We need something that's going to get there fast. It's able to is going to be able to defend itself against potential enemy interactions, especially submarines, which were a major, major annoyance for the Japanese at this point. And um, enemy aircraft. Well, the destroyers are what the Japanese look at. They're overworked, 
far too few destroyers. And so that's what they're doing. They're using their destroyers. This is the Tokyo Express. This is what we're talking about. It's early days of that, but it is the Tokyo Express. And these two destroyers, which are going to, I'm going to talk about in a second, are part of that. They are part of the Tokyo Express operation. They're part of the resupplies. And it's all done through Second Fleet. Now, Second Fleet is not run by idiots. Second Fleet is run by Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo and his Chief of Staff, Rear Admiral uh, Kazutaka Shirashi. Now, I would say of both these officers, both of them, they are very experienced. They are very skilled. Usually we know of Shirashi because he's following around Kondo. Kondo is a very experienced officer. He's a very useful officer. And he's in command of Second Fleet, which is not exactly a bad position to be in. It had been first stood up in October 1903. Second Fleet is usually the force grouping of many of the cruisers and destroyers of the IGN. And as a result, there are very few battles, very few actions, which from 1903 onwards do not involve ships of this fleet. It is a critical organization. It's also a good example of the structuring of the Japanese Navy. Because Second Fleet is this critical organization. And Nobutaki Kondo and Kazutaka Shirashi are heavily involved in planning. And yet they are almost invisible in much of the discussion outside of Japan of the history of the Second World War. Because of the way it's reported, because of the way it's discussed, they very rarely get to lead their forces actually in action. They do a lot of the planning, the organization, but that's not their role to go charging off to the front. Honestly, they would have probably been better than some of the admirals who do get given more active commands, but they don't. They get entrusted with a very important, almost sacred position. In fact, if you want a real measure of Nobutaki Kondo's status and standing and the respect they had of him at the time, it's the fact that he is left in command by both Japanese and British authorities' agreement to fight the communist Viet Minh guerrillas in Indochina in 1945. He's left in command. He's trusted to be an honourable and good officer. He became a businessman after the war, and he survived. He was not one of the ones who was prosecuted. In fact, as far as we can be concerned, personal facts, liked by all officers, punctual and methodical, always listened to others before making a decision, and considered a good bureaucrat. Had opposed the midway invasion plan since the island could not be supplied after, easily after capture. He had been part of the midway invasion fleet and had at one point actually theoretically achieved command um, when Nangumo is having his issues. He had held the post of naval attaché in London, and only returned to Japan in November 1941. Now, that might be a little bit of confusion because of um, uh, Taishiro Kondo, who is another officer who was also naval attaché in London, and there is a dispute as to whether it was Nobutake Kondo or Taishiro Kondo. I would say, potentially, potentially both had, uh, had that experience. It does seem to me, uh, when you look at some of his operations and some of his discussions, especially post-war when he's surrendering, that Kondo did have a fairly good understanding of the British. Now, he could have got those interactions as an officer with bumping into British ships. 
but he could have also been in it and served time as an attaché, and he does have a very long career. If I give you an example, this is the book I use for those informations, Shokan uh, Hirohito Samurai, and um, his summary goes all the way down this page and continues on to here. Most officers' summaries are about these sort of lengths. So if you have this level of detail and this level of information about a gentleman, and he has done as much as this particular gentleman did, well, life gets interesting. And the odds of him having done even more go up a bit. I don't know. He certainly seems to be an avid student of both staff work and of history, which is probably one of the reasons why he's considered a bit of a bureaucrat by some of his colleagues. But mm, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Anyway, he's in charge of organizing the fleet which are doing all these operations. He's the one who's ultimately responsible for things like the Tokyo Express, etc., uh, being organized, administered. Others might have the uh, might have the idea, and others might claim they're running it on the ground. But the reality is, he's the one who's organizing it above. Now, where am I getting details from the ba about the battle? Because as I've just shown you, I've got the details about the Japanese officers. Where am I getting details about a battle? Well, there'll be a link down below to this, but this is the Solomon Islands campaign, bombardments of Munda and Villa Stanmore, and this is the point here. The USNI. The US, well, the USNI, I want to say, Office of Naval Intelligence only. USNI hosts this and have these sort of sites up, which variously are grouped under USNI. They support them all. Um, the Office of Naval Intelligence actually provided compilation about this opera, these operations and others, and the battle doesn't is considered so routine it doesn't even feature in the titles. It's just, oh, we did the bombardment of Munda and Villa Stanmore, and this is one of the bomb during one of the bombardments we fought a battle. But there is actual link to it down below, and that's a good account. It does give the wider context of the campaign. I have to admit, I have not only read the digital version, I have printed out some of it as well myself. Why did I print some of it out? Well, again, this is part of my dyslexia, but some people find it easier to put coloured films up on screens and do all sort of tinting, and some people use coloured films for their reading stuff, and that helps them. It doesn't ha It isn't my particular type. I, again, I, I'm doing this a bit because I was in another conversation this morning where someone was basically saying there's only one type of dyslexia. Dyslexia is a very broad spectrum used to cover a very broad range of differences and learning differences, and that's basically what it means. Um, some of us work better with reading physical copies. That's what we learn from. Sometimes you need to use colour tints. That helps and makes it better for you. For others, they're a faff which annoy them. And for those of you who heard uh, some strange noises going on and the video paused, my sister managed to fall over in the garden. She maintained it was due to the fluffy research assistants tag-teaming her, but I, I don't say. I, I think they're innocent. They both looked completely innocent to me. The fact that one had jumped up to try and give her a hug and the other one had been standing behind her legs, I think it's just a complete, completely circumstantial evidence at best. I think it's just, you know, things happen. Okay? But I have sorted it. She is fine. Getting back into this. It's a really great thing to go and read. If you want to go and read through the full report, it is massive and long. The, the section that I have printed out for myself is roughly 30 pages long. Um, I found it useful to do so, to read through, to uh, get a better understanding of the official report, but also to look at the track charts, to go and look at the instructions being given to the various officers involved. It, it's one of the benefits we can do, which people can't do at a time. One of the benefits you can do with historical analysis. And you always have to be careful uh, to an extent when critiquing people at the time, because they don't have the same benefits of the 2020 360 vision you can, to an extent, impose on a situation. You can go and read the commander's statements. You can go and read what they say was going through their minds at the time. 
you can go and look at the track charts, you can look at the various standing orders, you can look at the instructions everyone was operating under, the operating procedures, the rules of engagement, and you can look at everything from above and go, wow, well, if they'd done this at this point, then they could have intercepted at this point. Well, that would have required them to know, A, what was happening there, and B, what that person was thinking about the next decision. So you always have to apply a what I call a reading history forwards approach. You always have to start almost at the first point back you can get and read it forwards, not read it backwards with the knowledge of hindsight of what actually happened. And when you're making assessments of the people involved. The USN command in in this area at the time, basically comes down to two people, one of whom is actually involved. Whereas we're talking about the earlier Japanese commanders, neither of them is at the fight. They weren't expecting a big fight. There is no senior officer there. It is merely a couple of destroyer officers in charge. And even they don't really get a chance to exercise much kind of command. They are caught completely unawares. You have the commander, South Pacific Area, Vice Admiral William Halsey hard charger, a gentleman famous for not giving in, not giving up, and keep pushing forward. This is him, of course. The other officer you have who is actually at the battle is Rear Admiral Aaron S. Merrill. And Merrill's an interesting officer. If it hadn't been for the presence of Ching Lee, Vice Admiral uh, Lee, who was the probably the American's best and arguably in World War II, the best battleship group commander, gunnery commander of a group of surface ships. There are others who are arguably better fleet commanders, better task force commanders when it comes to involving carriers and mixed commanders and all these sort of things, but when you're talking about a gunnery surface action force, I think you have a lot of trouble finding better than Lee. One of the people that actually does give him a run for his money, though, is Merrill. Merrill has an excellent sense of timing, an excellent sense of risk evaluation. Not even assessment, risk evaluation. Assessing risk is acknowledging where the risk is and working out what kind of risk it is, what kind of level of risk is. Evaluating risk is whether the risk is worth it over running that risk is worth the reward, and what the likelihood of that risk actually panning out is. And Merrill has real strengths in that sort of scenario. He really does understand going, we're running this, this, and this risk. That works for me. That works for me. He does have an advantage when he's doing this, though. He has an advantage in that he has very solid forces. They're pretty much all Fletcher class destroyers and they're all well, you can tell because she's there Cleveland class cruisers. It's a very much a uniform force. It's the advantage of being the US Navy at this point. You are literally churning out copies of the same things. There is an advantage in producing a huge volume of 70-80% solutions. It's one of the things we have forgotten, you can argue, with the history of the Cold War. That we concentrate on now on producing the best of the best of the best we can. Pushing ourselves almost down the route of the Japanese and the Germans in World War II. Instead of going, well, you know what? Yeah, we could make something which is a 95, maybe even 98% solution. But that's going to cost so much in time and money that we'll only be able to get mm, a dozen of those. Or we could make something which is going to be a lot easier to manufacture. It's probably going to be about an 80, 75, 80% solution. And we can afford to run three to four dozen of those. There is a desire always to make war as safe as you can do. 
to make conflict as manageable as possible and to give yourself an advantage when it comes to conflict in terms of a technological edge which is going to allow you to deploy more force at critical points than the enemy can. However, Part of being able to deploy force where the enemy can't is having things in the positions where they can deploy force. And that requires a certain amount of mass, a certain, a certain amount of volume of force itself. Precision warfare is a great thing. It can really make a tremendous difference in your risk profiles. However, you can't conduct any warfare without actually having the units and the systems there to do it. And so you always need to balance are we procuring the absolute best thing we can, or are we procuring the best fit for what we need? In this scenario, Merrill has a force which is the absolute best fit for what he needs. Could you have procured better? Well, I would argue that if you consider that destroyers are going in to do a gunnery action, that probably a tribal class destroyer or something which is a gun destroyer would probably be a better a better fit for it. The Fletchers are good destroyers, though. They are more than fit for doing the job, but they're not a 90% solution. They are a 80%, 70% solution for all. So you can go better, but which is it better to have? small group of uh, tribals in American service for this kind of operation, or a huge swarm of Fletchers that you just pull some from on and you go, okay, right then. Theoretically, for this one with fire, we need a couple of tribals. Okay. For how many, uh, what's the equivalent volume of fire from Fletchers? Oh, we need about three. Well, that's good, because we have dozens upon dozens of Fletchers to call on. Just bring three. And that is the reality of mass and volume. That is the reality of what you can deploy. And that is the reality of fighting a world war. And that's the problem for the Japanese at this point. Because they didn't build up enough before war began. Especially not with the Yamato and Mashashi. And eventually, of course, Shinano. Um, all the programs they're running that are producing these very big ships means there isn't enough money or infrastructure around to produce enough volume of the smaller ships. And they can't even produce them when war begins because of the... Well, the resource and infrastructure limitations of the Japanese economic industrial complex. If we're being frankly honest. And this is why you have this scenario. You have... Let's be honest, it's this force. Six ships, three cruisers, three destroyers. This force doesn't get involved in the fight. They're there as well in the area. And if there had been a larger Japanese force, I have no doubt this force would have combined together. But it's these six ships versus two destroyers of the Japanese Navy. And let's consider the Cleveland and Fletcher classes, because let's be honest, these are good ships. These are very flexible, useful assets. So what makes these ships so good? Simple, really. It's not their guns. They're useful. It's not their size. They're an advantageous. It's not even their radars and equipment. Though having them does really, really add something to their capabilities of night fighting. What makes them useful is the fact that the Clevelands can do 8,640 nautical miles at 15 knots. And the Fletchers can do five and a half thousand nautical miles at 15 knots. That's a useful range. And if you're coming across the Pacific, those are the sort of ranges you need. As long as you're turning up in enough volume, you'll have enough firepower. And that's the other thing. They are able to be produced very, very easily. If we consider the Cleveland class, the US Navy plans to build... 52. They actually do build 27. Three were cancelled and nine were converted to light aircraft carriers and 
13 are then reordered as the uh, Fargo class cruisers, which are basically, well, improved Clevelands. Let, let's call them improved Clevelands. They are not in any way, shape, or form someone taking a Cleveland and going, what happens if we add more of everything and then see how it goes with this whole machine spirit thing that the Imperium's been working on. It sounds like a good idea. Let's see. That's in not that's entirely not what the Fargo class are like. And, you know, the Fletchers, well, if we consider the Fletcher class, the US Navy orders some region of 180. They complete 175. They cancelled 13 officially, but there's a reason I'm saying they ordered Summer Region 180, because it's officially cancelled 13. Um, it could be a lot more, and it could be Region of 180 could be up to 200. There are discussions that some yards thought they might have more, more ordered, or have been told they were going to get more ordered. But those orders were mostly turned into Sumner class, so, you know, it works out. It works out, and um, of those, 175 actually completed. Uh, 19 were lost. Six were damaged and not repaired because the USN had the Sumner class coming through and they had such a sheer volume, they decided that, frankly, we don't need to rebuild this unit. We can just roll out a new one. You know, it's, that's the classic thing for the Japanese. Uh, when... They lose ships. They start readjusting their metrics for what's an acceptable number for the of the American ships for them to fight. So basically, it goes from two to one to three to one to four to one, at which they still think they should win, according to their view of themselves. When the Americans lose a ship, they replace it with about three others. So this causes a very, very how do I put this? One-sided concept of operations and a one-sided battle feel to start to take place after the war's gone on long enough. Uh, the Japanese honestly believe they can take on any eight American ships, with roughly two of theirs, and the Americans, if they lose a ship, turn up, uh, lo lose one ship, the group will next be going around with about 12 ships. Um, what can I say? It, it, it's, it's not really fair. And the sheer volume of production... That's the advantage. I have to say, having had the joy of wandering around the Sullivans, it really did give me an idea of going, ooh, this is what a true, true medium destroyer is like. And what do I mean by medium destroyer? I mean, it's about a 75% solution for pretty much any job you could require a destroyer for. It's got torpedoes. Well, hey, it can do the torpedo attack. It's got guns. It can do gunfire. It's got anti-aircraft systems. It's got anti-submarine systems. It's got everything you pretty much need. It's got a top speed of 36 and a half knots. At no point was I sitting there thinking, this is a gun destroyer, or this is a, a surface anti-surface destroyer with its torpedoes. I was thinking, this is a medium destroyer. Yes, it displaces 2,000 tons, so, you know, it's a little bit on the heavy side for just being called a medium destroyer, but it is really a medium destroyer, because there is no point at which you're going to it and going, you know what, what you are is entirely focused around one thing. I would argue that having the two quintuple torpedo tube mounts um, does give them a slightly heavier torpedo element, but let's be honest, for that period, that's pretty standard for a general purpose medium destroyer. The thing is, it's there's a reason why in my book I put that the birth of general purpose destroyers is when you have a more gun-heavy armament. But for a medium destroyer in this period, you'd expect a torpedo-heavy armament because that's what they're oriented around. So that makes it a medium destroyer. It's still pretty general purpose, still pretty flexible. It'll do pretty much all the jobs you want. And this is the thing. We've got a group of medium destroyers, for want of a better description, Especially now I've explained it, so hopefully no one's riding bomb going, they were a heavy destroyer, or they were a large fleet destroyer. You're understanding that my context is medium here is they are not orientated around anything. 
they are orientated around being good destroyers that are an 80% individually an 80, 75, 80% solution to pretty much any problem. And if you want a 100% solution, send two. We've got nearly 180 to things. Fine, we'll send two. And you, then we have no longer got a 70% or 80, 75% or 80% solution. We've got 150% to 160% solution to a problem. That actually sounds a lot better than a 100% solution if you think about it. And it's the same with the Clevelands. They're produced in volume, they're produced in capability, and again, they are just these flexible, general-purpose assets. They're carrying 12 6-inch 47s, Mark 16 variety. They're carrying 12 of the 5-inch uh, 38s and 6 dual turrets, dual mounts. Uh, they've got 40mm Bofors all over the place. They've got Oricon 20mm all over the place. They haven't got torpedoes, but they do carry float planes. They're useful. Pretty much everything the US Navy requires of a cruiser, they can do. That's what you want. So what are the US Navy sending? They are sending some very flexible assets... Which, okay, yes, you could go, well, for uh, for fire, uh, for bombardment, sure bombardment, surely we better send a battleship. Yeah, it would, but it's not going to be as fast unless you can send an Iowa, and you don't really want to send an Iowa off on its own to do this, and it's probably too, a bit too much. So what we send is a group, of, a group of cruisers. Oh, should we send a heavy cruiser? Well, you can, but we've got a lot more of these light cruisers, these six-inch gun vessels wandering around, and frankly... Okay, yes, we could find two 8-inch cruisers to send, but we could also send three 6-inch cruisers, and we might as well. And, oh, we'll give them sort of an escort fire assist of some destroyers as well. It's the US Navy sitting there going, we have this volume, we can use it. The old phrase, quantity is a quality all of its own. Well, here is the demonstration of why, why quantity is a quality all of its own. It allows you to do things. It allows you to make choices. It allows you to make judgments of, you know what, I'd really rather not risk a battleship or a heavy cruiser on this one, but I've got enough light cruiser and destroyers that, frankly, I'll just send more of those than, you know, that in terms of ship numbers, and they'll do the job for me. It allows you to make that assessment. That is what quantity allows. In contrast, the Japanese destroyers involved are not even part of the same class, let alone the same division. They'd only actually, well, operated together pretty much for this operation. Uh, they have not had much of a prior experience of directly operating with each other. They've operated with each other, of course, through a command structure, through being part of the same squadron or similar squadrons. But whilst they've been part of the 4th Destroyer Squadron, uh, Murasame had been the Shiratsu class vessel, had been part of the 2nd Destroyer Division, and uh, Mingyomyo had been part of the 9th Destroyer Division. So they're not the same types of ships. They don't have the same operating characteristics. In fact, if you start looking at them seriously, you sort of go, well, um... Someone had some bright ideas, didn't they? Someone. Someone obviously had, because the top speed of the Shiatsu is 34 knots. The shot top speed of the Asayo class vessel, the Mingumu, is 35 knots. Um, they've got very different in terms of their gun fits, because one has two twin turrets and a single turret, and one ha the other has three twin turrets. Uh, they have a range of AA gun differences. They have a range of focus in terms of their torpedo fits uh, and how they're out of their sort of aligned. And one has arguably a lot more capability than the other. One is 1,712 tons in standard. That is the Shiatsu class vessel, the which is actually has the commander in it. That is what Lieutenant Commander Yoji Tangashami uh, Shima is in charge of. He's in charge of the smaller, slower, less well-armed vessel. 
in contrast, the shale, well, that is the faster. That is well over 2,000 tons in standard. And, well, it's actually capable of doing a lot more in terms of firepower and capabilities. But it doesn't really matter the capabilities of these ships. The reality of the fight is they never get a chance to do anything. They're just trundling along. See, the Japanese have a very finely developed night fighting capabilities. But those night fighting capabilities are predicated on roughly three things. One, if you're going to be launching a long-range torpedo attack at your opponent, you're presuming they're going to be idiots. And by idiots, I mean they're going to sail in a straight line. Two, you need to know they're there. You need to know they're there a long time before they know you're there. Which you can do before radar is really widespread. But at the moment radar is widespread, and whilst you have some receivers, not all of your vessels are fitted with radar. In fact, very few. The retrofitting of vessels with radar done out by the Japanese is as fast as their infrastructure and capabilities can allow them to do so. Which is not very fast. Not very fast at all. It's a sad thing. It really is. So that leads us to the battle and the whole setting. And what I'm going to do for this is I'm going to, broadly speaking, give you a, a reading out of what's in the battle description in, by put, compiled by Oni, the Office of Naval Intelligence, which we discussed earlier. And then I'm going to give you some analysis and go into it and try and add some context to it. But I think it's interesting to hear how they wrote it up. And whilst I'm doing the reading, I'm probably going to increase the size of the screen so you can read along, but also check out the maps at the same time. Okay? With that all being said, we join the fleet on... Well, as they leave San Cristobal. As directed, all vessels scheduled to take part in the operation completed their fueling and arrived at Espirito Santo at 0600 hours on the 4th for detailed discussion and plans. Com Air South Pacific, unfortunately, was at the time in Numea, but a large delegation of his staff, as well as the commanding officer of all the ships and task force, came aboard Montpellier immediately for the conference. I'd just like to point out some small thing here. This is a routine operation, a routine bombardment. Why is anyone in Oni expecting the Com Commander Air South Pacific to be there in person? I... There are so many digs in some of these Oni reports about the Commander Air South Pacific. You get a real idea that someone in Oni doesn't like him. And they want to make it look like, oh, he wasn't at these meetings in person. He should have been. Why? He's the commander of all air operations in the South Pacific. He's probably busy. It's a routine bombardment. If it was a major fleet operation and you're preparing for a major action, yeah, then turn up yourself. If not, if it's a routine operation, send your staff. You know, why are you expecting the poor guy to be there all the time in person? He's, I was going to say he's got a life. He's got other jobs. He's got quite a responsibility. He's literally responsible for the aircraft in the whole of the South Pacific. Why do you keep expecting him to turn up to routine meetings about a bombardment mission? I know air threat is the greatest thing, but if you're so worried about the air threat, send a carrier to provide them their air defense. I mean, that's the whole big blue blanket doctrine which comes out about this time. You know, send some escort carriers loaded with fighters. There are options here if you are so obsessed and so worried. The poor person who's in charge of aircraft in South Pacific doesn't need to be at every meeting in person to sign off on and got plans going, yes, aircraft will be assigned to you. No. That's what he has a staff for. They will be there. They will assign the aircraft. That's what their job is to do in a bureaucracy like staff organizations have to become when you're controlling Thousands upon thousands of moving pieces of a complicated war machine. You can't keep expecting every five minutes the head of several thousand of those blocks to turn up at your little meeting and go, Yes, 
We're all having a meeting about a routine operation. I'm going to be here in person. They have other things to do. Now, the air delegation brought with them many excellent photographs of the bombardment area at Munda and Villa Stanmore, as well as grid overlays and mosaics showing target locations compiled from the latest photographic interpretations and intelligence reports. A representative of the Black Cats was also present to consult with and arrange for the transportation of the ship's spotters by plane to the locations of the bombardment. Detailed arrangements for air coverage of the task force during the entire operation was completed and later confirmed by letter from Commander Air South Pacific. Again, this is exactly what you want him to do. Why did was there needed to be the dig about, unfortunately, at that time in Yamea? You don't need to mention it. You could have just written, Commander Air South Pacific, staff were at the meeting. That's all you need to say. All that needs to be said. You don't need to make a big thing about it. But they do. In view of the fact that both previous bombardments and retirements have been carried out with an almost machine-like precision and with a minimum of enemy interference, it seemed advisable to repeat the same general tactics on this occasion. Always a good idea to do the same thing three times in a row. But there again, the reality of the situation was at this point, the Japanese don't have the equipment to interfere in this area, so you can do things machine-like because they don't have anything they can deploy to interfere with you. It seemed advisable to repeat the same general tactics on this occasion. All navigation was to be uh, uh, to be by SG radar. Fire was to be continuous after the first ranging salvos, and column formation was to be used for the actual bombardment to avoid mutual illumination of air units, of our units. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you have a staggered formation, and I fire here, I will illuminate this cruiser here. So if you stagger them, let's say you have one here, one here, and one here, this one firing will illuminate these two vessels. If they're in line, then they don't illuminate each other. It makes sense for actually a night strike operation. It is also the point at which they are most their weak, they're at the weakest point vis-a-vis -vis enemy torpedo attack. If you were a Japanese officer trying to do a long-range torpedo strike, You'd want to wait till they started bombardment and they're proceeding in a straight line. Because you know for they have to do this and you can sort of predict their positions. And if you could really, if you really was really successful, what you'd want to do is aim for the points where they are turning. That area where they are all going to be passing through the same area. If you get a decent spread of torpedoes running through there as they're turning, you could take out cruisers. So there are real risks in this operation, despite it being done with machine-like precision. Now, practically simultaneous fire was to be employed by the cruisers since the previous attack on Villa Stanmore had conclusively shown that by this means the group could pour a more concentrated and destructive weight of shells on target and improve its chances of making clean getaway by reducing the period of its stay in dangerous waters. As before, the primary task of destroyers in Kula Gulf was to protect against submarines and patrol vessels and silence enemy shore batteries so that the cruisers could bombard unhindered. Caution dictated minor deviations from the previous patterns, however. Because of the reported presence of enemy shipping in the general target areas, it was deemed advisable that the cruisers be ready to illuminate Cooler Gulf with star shells before reaching the firing line, thereby preventing the escape of or attack by possible enemy units in the vicinity. Furthermore, despite the fact that the waters off Munda were far less confining than those in the Cooler Gulf, it was believed that the combined pattern could best be preserved by simultaneous and concentrated firing of the part of destroyers of the Munda detachment, even though this procedure might result in less effective spotting by the Black Cats. On the morning of the 4th, all the ships completed their, uh, completed firing their allowance ammunition from the Pyro, and at noon, Task Force Mike departed for its destination, 839 miles to the northwest. The passage was without incident, except for the fact that, because of strong headwinds, it became necessary to increase speed from 24 to 25 knots, and finally to 26 knots, to maintain the predetermined schedule. 
Contrary to weather reports and expectations based on meteorological conditions during the preceding months, the afternoon and evening of the 5th broke clear and cool. As the force steamed up through Len Lengo Channel and Savo Sound, there was not a cloud in the brilliant blue sky. The ships had been under fighter co coverage since daylight. Again, that Commander Air South Pacific is doing a really good job, despite not having turned up personally to the meeting. It's amazing. It's almost as if the staff are functioning like they're supposed to. I mean, seriously, but he didn't turn up in person, you know that? He, he, he had another thing he had to go to. That's just terrible. We have to write that in the only assessment of it. The ships had been under fighter coverage since daylight. In the Guadalcanal area, the air was completely controlled by friendly planes. The circumstance, this circumstance, combined with the unusual visibility, seemed to preclude the possibility of enemy snoopers giving the alarm. Until dusk, only one, un one unidentified plane had been appeared on the radar screen, and this fleeting bogey was reported 28 miles to the westward. Although it was most unusual for an American task force to remain in waters north of 15 deg degrees south latitude for any length of time without detection, Rear, Al uh, Rear Admiral Merrill felt there was an excellent chance that his command had not been observed. Darkness fell at 18.45 hours as the vessels were approaching the departure point seven miles north of Daisen Island in the Russell Group. All ships went to general quarters. At 20 hundred hours, the Munda detachment left the formation without signal and proceeded on course 250 degrees T under the command of Captain Briscoe to carry out its assignment. Now, this is a very sensible thing and it's also worthwhile noting this force has not communicated at all while they're doing this. They haven't been doing radio communications. Some flash signals have been going backwards and forwards, but that's it. They have literally been running this on we only communicate if we have to. Otherwise, we all know the plan and we follow through on the plan. While the Munda destroyers sped away at 25 knots into the darkness... The free cruisers and their escort of destroyers continued on course, planning to run as close as safe navigation permit to the north ashore of the new Georgia island before making the turn to, into Kula Gulf and the firing line. With a mild sea causing a lively surf along the shore, it was believed that hugging the coast would decrease the risk of detection by making the ship's wakes less conspicuous from the air. The cruisers were disposed in column, the destroyers screening 6,000 yards ahead. The group had employed no form of communication since dark, and the use of TBS had been rigidly restricted prior to that time, yet all previously determined changes of course and speed were made precisely on time and in perfect order. Until 21.15 hours, the passage was uneventful. No planes, other than the three black cats carrying the spotters of the southern shore of Santa Isabel Island, were picked up by the radar and not a sign of enemy activity was sighted. It began to seem as though the hope for had happened, and that ships would reach their destination undiscovered, when a disturbing radio message from Guadalcanal was intercepted. Commander Air Souls, Gomez Souls, was relaying a Coast Watchers report that two Japanese light cruisers or large destroyers had left at Farsi at 19.10 hours and were heading south at high speed. Shortly afterwards, the first spotting Black Cat radioed Guadalcanal, which in turn informed the task force that it had sighted two enemy cruisers heading east by south at 30 knots in latitude 0735 south and longitude 156 50 east. Well, I can see why you might think these are cruisers. Again, this is the joy of visual spotting and visual reporting and reconnaissance. You sometimes get the scale wrong. And sometimes, let's be honest, even in modern movies, what was actually historically a destroyer or a frigate looks like a Yamato-class battleship, because that's what they're putting in them. A study of the enemy's location, course, and speed led the commander task force to believe it highly probable the Japanese had located at least part of the American forces and were racing to intercept them. In reality, it was actually the vessels coming down for a resupply mission. They were resupplying and heading back. But he doesn't know that, so he's presuming the worst. Now, in the first place, it was extremely unlikely the enemy would dispatch surface forces as late as 1900 hours to attack the nearest American base in the Russell Islands, since the distance was too great to give them night coverage on the return trip. 
Secondly, their reported departure coincided closely with the only occasion when hostile scouts might have spotted our forces. The brief period shortly before dusk when the strange bogey had flashed across the screen. The course of positions transmitted by the Black Cat seemed to indicate that the destination two vessels, especially if they were destroyers, might be in Blackett Strait, either via Vela Gulf or Kula Gulf. If this assumption was correct, their speed would put them in the strait at about 22.30 hours. As the Vela Stanmore's group scheduled called for a course change to, the, to port into Kula Gulf, although this report, I have to admit, I do love this only report because it uses to the left. So I, I do wonder realistically who's writing this only report because naval personnel talk in port and starboard because that's not when they're making a turn not to the left. They're turning to port or starboard. But you know, it's wartime. All sorts of people have been added into the navy. We'll give this person a break on that one. After all, they worry so much about the presence of Commander Air South Pacific. You know, maybe they were so worried about that they they couldn't remember if it was left or port or starboard or right. And the distance from Norfolk Gulf to the eastern entrance of the strait was 20 miles. It seemed to the Command Task Force to be useless to change its plans and increase speed, especially at the risk of having nearest communica necessary communications give warning of the approach. On the other hand, the enemy's destination and intentions were not at all clear. There could be no sound reason for his sending two cruisers or destroyers to intercept a far larger force, even considering the possibility the Japanese ships had not been properly identified and were in reality the two heavy cruisers which had been reported the previous day to have arrived at Bern from the north escorting two cargo vessels. As said, the larger convoys tend to get a heavy escort. It was thought possible, however, that the two ships might be planning to proceed to the east end of Blackett Strait, and there, obscured from radar detection by the cover of the steep shoreline, await the opening of the bombardment before attacking. At this point, Admiral Merrill really starts to show his metal. After weighing the various hypotheses and theories, and noting the difficulty and danger of the changing plans at the last minute, Admiral Merrill decided to carry through his original scheme with two small alterations. The first was to order a slight increase in revolutions to effect arrival at the firing line about five minutes before the zero hour for the moment. This was to ensure that the Munda detachment would not open fire first and alert the enemy vessels should they be in the strait. The second was to draft a message to be given out to the Villa Stanmore group when it was well into the Gulf, warning of the possible presence of the enemy, and giving notice that when the Montpellier fired her star shells to illuminate Black in the Strait, the other vessel should take under fire any hostile units revealed. If none were sighted, the bombardment was to proceed as planned. At 0010 hours, six minutes ahead of the schedule set by the operational plan, the Montpellier followed by Cleveland and Denver, changed course to 240 degrees T to swing into the Kula Gulf and reduce speed from 25 to 20 knots. In accordance with the orders, the Waller maintained her position 6,000 yards ahead, detached from formation for an advanced sweep of the Gulf over the intended track. The Conway took station 2,000 yards ahead of the flagship and the Coney dropped back on the port quarter of the cruisers to protect against motor torpedo attacks from the many small coves which intent indent the eastern shore of the Gulf. The night was exceptionally dark, so black that the navigation had to be entirely by SG radar. At 0336 hours, the flagship picked up the Tungarili Point, bearing 214 degrees. Three minutes later, the formation, still at 20 knots, turned to 213 degrees to slip down the bay as close to the east coast as feasible. At this point, the Waller and the Conway were 6,000 and 2,000 yards respectively ahead of the Montpellier. Cleveland was 1,000 yards astern of the flagship. The Denver followed behind the Cleveland at 1,000 yards, and the Connie had taken two, station 2,000 yards off the Denver's port quarter. At 0053 hours... Now, this is where I think the report might have been a little bit mistaken. Because you might have heard me just read 0336 hours. I think that's 0 36 hours. I don't think it's 0056 hours. 36 hours. And the reason I say it's 0036 hours is because that fits with the timeline. But I read it out as the report is written and as the report is published on the site. So this is the joy. Sometimes even what could be considered primary sources, because this is a government produced document, will contain errors that no one seems to have pointed or spotted it out in all its production and all its uploading and everyone dealing with it. They've all gone, oh. 
And, well, it's good to know that the person who's so far used the word left instead of port and is was ups really upset that Commander Air, Commander Air South Pacific didn't turn up to a meeting themselves and said sent the staff can also make a mistake. So I'm fairly sure it's at 0036 hours the flagship picked up Tungurli Point at bearing 2 and 14 degrees, but I did read it as it was written. And as it is there. Just maybe they're time traveling. Maybe all the ships are TARDISes, but I doubt it. Now, at 0053 hours, as the flagship attempted to get a radar bearing on some, uh, Sasamboki Island, the next point of navigational interest, a large pip appeared on the screen. The pip gave a bearing of 234 degrees T, and a distance of 14,300 yards. Exactly the predicted direction of the island, but about 9,000 yards short. Radar plot was so informed. And in about a minute, reported the pip must be regarded as an enemy vessel. Seconds later, the pip divided and indicated two ships on an approximately an opposite course from the bombardment group. By this time, all the other ships had made contact. Aboard most of them, exactly as in the Montpellier, the pips had, se uh, had separated into two clearly defined elements. All began tracking the enemy and training their guns. At approximately 0100 hours, the flagship broke silence to make a contact report over TBS and ordered the task group to stand by for commence firing. A few seconds after 0101 hours, the Montpellier opened for her, uh, with her main battery, followed almost immediately by the Cleveland and the Denver. All three cruisers without prearrangement, this is the, this is the problem of not communicating with each other, uh, concentrated their fire on the second ship in the column, perhaps because it developed a better pip on their radar screens, the first few salvos appeared to straddle, but on the Montpellier's sixth salvo at about 0106 hours, so within five minutes of firing commencing, really, a fire blazed up fiercely in the enemy's after gun mount. Immediately thereafter, explosion after the midship sent a column of flame roaring into the air, kind of like though when you see a turret blow up on Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts, beginning as a deep red ball and ending in a gigantic mushroom of fire 150 feet above the target's decks. As the light silhouetted her for an instant, the Cleveland's main battery spotters identified her as a large destroyer by the narrow white band on the top of her raked stack. Meanwhile, the Waller, which had been carefully tracking the enemy from her position 6,000 yards ahead of the column, fired a spread of five torpedoes just as the cruisers opened with their main batteries. She had estimated the enemy's speed at 24 knots. Apparently, the cruiser's gunfire had slowed her target down. However, just as the fire was at its height, the left-wing torpedo struck the burning enemy amidships with a tremendous explosion. The vessel immediately broke in two and sank, leaving a glowing mass of wreckage surrounded by burning oil in the water. She had fired only a few ineffective shots. The American cruisers, as soon as they saw that, their first target was out of action and practically dead in the water, had checked fire and swung their batteries towards the leading enemy ship, which continued on her northerly course, firing spasmodically without salvos. She steamed ahead for about four miles under concentrated fire of all three cruisers before the flagship's radar plot reported that she had come to a complete stop. Flaming, duly from repeated hits, the first salvos of both the Denver and Montpellier had struck home, her fire became weaker and her more erratic. At about 0130 hours, the Waller was ordered to close and finish her off before the destroyer could get in position. The enemy had sunk. At this point, the shore bombardment begins. It had actually started when the engagement was at, service engagement was at its height, because the Denver had ceased firing the first Japanese ship and was training the second. Her fire control officer spotted a shore battery firing on the, them from Tsunami Point, and decided that as his starboard five-inch battery was not engaged at the time, he could make use of them. So they opened up on landward flashes. The first salvo had fallen short, but he walked the uh, point of impact up the hill, and after expending only 84 rounds, he straddled and silenced the enemy battery. <sighs> so there you go. There is a battle. It's over in a few minutes. It's hours and hours of tension. It's hours of wonder. And the whole way through, no one actually knew what the Japanese were doing. They're making assumptions. Their assumptions are always being on the Japanese 
being aggressive and attacking them, because it's more sensible than presuming, oh, the Japanese aren't coming, etc., or anything like that. The whole way through, that is what they act like. And that gives them the safety and security to do what they need to do. Now, in terms of summary of this action, it's not a nice fight if you're a Japanese. It really isn't. It's not a good fight if you're the Japanese. It's actually a very, very dangerous and nasty fight if you're the Japanese. And the Americans do well. They've got a finely coordinated force that works well together. That are made up of a homogenous groups of ships. So they can get the best out of each other. They've also got well-trained crews by this point. And they have lots of warning about what's coming. They have information warfare advantages to prepare themselves. Even when Miller can't share the information, he's still made the decisions. He's prepared. He's worked out what he's going to do. It makes it a lot easier to fight a battle if you know in advance, well, if the enemy does X, I will do Y. If they do W, I'll do Z. If they do T, I'll do S. If you know, have in your head worked out roughly some set of options of what they're going to do, and how you're going to respond, it makes it far quicker for you to implement those responses when things happen. And for you to adapt to those responses. Oh, they haven't quite done X. But it's close to X. So if I modify Y, I can do that and that will work. And it's easier to modify. It's easier to do that than to try and think, under pressure, I've got to come up with a solution to this instantaneously. It's proper preparation. For the Japanese, in contrast, what were these ships doing? These ships were literally taking supplies to the base at Villa. They had managed to get to Villa through the Villa Gulf and Blackett Strait, and they had dropped off their su supplies, and they were returning to the Shortland Islands via the route through the Kula Gulf. If they had gone the other way, they might not have been caught. They might not have been lost. And sadly enough, this is a battle which results in the Japanese losing two destroyers, 174 personnel killed, and two captured. And for the Americans, it's almost a footnote in the bombardment. And one of the more interesting things to consider about the battle is that during the engagement, the Coney, fulfilling her task of sweeping the nearby harbours, um, had to actually deal with considerable seagull trouble. Uh, the birds were constantly appearing on her radar screen and were attracted both assiduously and futilely by the gun director. Ah, well. Also, what was another interesting thing is the Black Cats, which were the watching aircraft that were providing support and providing the uh, uh, spotting, they kept losing the American ships because they couldn't see them from above. What are the consequences of the battle? Well, for the Japanese, they lost two more destroyers they really couldn't afford to lose. For the Americans, they have further routine, uh, routinized um, the bombardment operations they're doing. And if we consider this is the Tokyo Express, this is the route. Well, one of the routes. They are pushing their way further and further up the Guadalcanal. They're pushing further and further up through the Solomons. This is at Kolomonga, which is there. Just above Georgia, in the New Georgia Islands, that is Kolomonga. And that's where we're talking about, the strait between Kolomonga and New Georgia. That is where the Americans have pushed them to. And the stronger and more, uh, the stronger the Americans get in confidence, the more and more they grow in their cap and their understanding of their capabilities, the more and more they're going to do these things. The more and more they use their mass. This battle is not a great battle. 
It's not one which probably made much in the splash in the newspapers at the time. And wasn't really even the important thing for the Americans when you consider they spend far more time talking about bombardments than they do to battle in the write-ups. But it's important for us in looking at it and going, well, this is what's happened to the Japanese war plan. This is what's happened to the Japanese, and it's something which was inevitable. The infrastructure limitations, the volume limitations, always meant that the Americans could do this. It was the capabilities intrinsic to their force. Anyway, I always finish these videos with a question. And so let's turn this on its to uh, on its head. What would the consequences have been of battle if the Japanese had seen the Americans coming and the Americans hadn't seen the Japanese? What would the consequences be if those Japanese had been able to launch a large torpedo strike on those cruisers? For the Japanese, losing two destroyers doesn't fundamentally undermine their war effort, but does honestly make their war effort a lot, lot weaker. Those are ships they can't afford to lose because they can't afford to replace them. But what happens if the Americans have lost three cruisers? Or even worse, for all three cruisers and three destroyers? If they lost them all to a torpedo attack? Probably would require more destroyers than the Japanese had there historically, but... You know, if the Japanese know the Americans are coming and they're, they're able to lie in wait and position themselves and not be detected by the Americans, what happens if they do that? It's worth our thinking. Would our memory of the conflict of the Solomon Islands campaign change? They had achieved something like that at Tassafaranga. That was a nasty battle for the Americans. What have we got coming up? Well, this week we have 824 Squadron, which is going to be a lot of fun. Thank you very much for watching. If you have liked, please do like, share, and subscribe. It would be really helpful because, as I've said on several other videos, I've got to get to 15,000 subscribers by about 23.59 hours on the 24th of December 2024 in order for my mum to get a free spa day courtesy of my aunt. That's a good treat for her, so I'm going to do my best. And secondly, honestly, I have noticed in my analytics that roughly two-thirds of my returning viewers are not subscribed. And I don't know why. The fact that my subscribed viewers are so reliable and are watching the videos as much as they are is wonderful. Thank you very much. But I'm, I'm really confused why up to why roughly two-thirds of people who regularly watch, and I'm talking about watching three or four videos of mine sometimes a week, because the average, it says, they're in the band of three to four videos. Uh, are not subscribed. I hope I haven't upset you or uh, annoyed you in some way that's made you decide to watch all my videos but not subscribe. Or maybe you are you think you still are subscribed and YouTube's unsubscribed you for some reason. I don't know, but please, thank you. Mm. Tell me why. Take care and have a nice day. Bye. Oh, and small thing, the reason I'm wearing the hat is when I started recording this video, I had the sun in my eyes, and I wasn't going to take my hat off halfway through. I thought it would look weird, but that's why I was wearing a hat. It was one of the few days a year the sun actually shines through my window in my office.